Thank you, President Walton. I do have a question for Assistant Chief Lazar, if that's appropriate. Definitely. And through the President to Assistant Chief Lazar, I was confused a little bit about your prior conversation and use of force in this new policy around robotic devices. Can you please explain, is this a new policy? Is the use of force? Can you just go into that a little bit more? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, our use of force policy is the very same. There is no change with regard to this additional technology. We have a general order that was just passed by the police commission that's been revised. It takes effect December 8th. That policy is still in effect no matter what we do, whether we use pepper spray or a firearm or a baton um, or any tool that we have. We have to follow our policies with regard to use of force. So that does not change. And as a matter of fact, speaking of the Department of Justice collaborative review and the reform and the 272 recommendations, you know, our policy of use of force has dramatically reduced the reportable use of force. We have thankfully had less officer-involved shootings than we did before we started all of our reform effort. So we're headed in the right direction. Thank you for that. And it, um, just a lot of things have been said. Has anything come up that you would like to address? So I want to make sure we talk about everything. Yeah, I just, uh, well, I thank you. Supervisor Mendelman and Supervisor Dorsey uh, have really just articulated it much better than me in terms of where we are exactly. Where we're at is a tool that we've had for 11 years. We have thoughtful police leadership that think through every situation and make determinations as to what the best option is. That's why we have had so many things happen in our city in the last 11 years, and we've never used this technology or this, this tool to do the things that we're describing. Uh, Supervisor Mendelman pointed out that with this assembly bill, we do have to articulate why we have this. And it, I, it's my belief, having been in this profession for 31 years, that there, will, that, that there may be a time that comes that we need to deploy something like this, and it will save a life. And to Supervisor Dorsey, to your point, we're not the only agency. Uh, the, the country today thinks San Francisco is the only agency, and this is something we're asking for. We've had it and other agencies in the Bay Area have it, and they use it, and we'll use it for the same thing that we'll use it for. The difference between some other agencies and us is, to your point, we're a world-class city, a world-class destination. Prior to the pandemic, we saw 25 million people, and we still are a target for many of the reasons that we discussed today. We have to be prepared, and our officers do a great job doing that. Thank, Thank you. you. I just wanted to um, make a few points. You know, right before this meeting, I got a text from my son, who's a 17-year-old senior, and he said, so what the heck are killer robots and are the supervisors voting on it? And it just, what has really bothered me about this conversation, which of course should be one we take very seriously, obviously with sensitive issues uh, that we must regard, um, is, the narrative around what's truly going on here. And if I didn't know any better, you know, you would think SFPD just woke up one day and thought it would be really cool to go out and get some killer robots and go terrorize the community. And that's not at all what's happening here. The rhetoric sounding, um, surrounding this conversation, in my opinion, has been nothing short of dishonest, disingenuous, and absolutely lacking in context in details. You know, I read everything that's come through. I saw the public defender's letter. He said the SFPD is fear-mongering and writing their own rules, and which I took issue with because they are literally complying with a rule, AB 481, and have been in front of the actual rules committee six times on this. And I really want to thank Supervisor Peskin and the members of the Rural Committee, uh, Supervisor Mandelman and Supervisor Chan, for really digging into this and coming up with something that they felt comfortable with so that they could forward on to the board for our vote. I feel like they've done a lot of work, and I'm very appreciative um, for pushing the envelope and going through all the drafts. I mean, if you, they're not writing their own rules when you look at the packet. You know, I just think, of course, there's reasons to fear police officers in situations that have come up for many people, and I do not want to downplay that at all. 
but the false narrative around SFPD's intention to both possess and use this equipment is just wrong, in my opinion. I feel like people have it backwards, that this equipment is actually there to save lives. And the lack of interest in the details of this policy before it started going out in the Twitter world, you know, was alarming to me because you get text messages like this from a 17 year old, like, mom, what are killer robots? What are the police doing? Why are they using killer robots? I mean, come on, you know, it's fear mongering against the police. You know, you've had this equipment for 11 years. You've never used it for deadly force. You went back after supervisor rightly pressed you and said, could it maybe be used? And you knew the Dallas case. So you said, yeah, maybe. But you use it for, to view scenes and you have never used it for deadly force. And I thank you for at least coming to us and saying, well, maybe it could be in this, in an extreme circumstance when many lives are in danger. And I'm sorry, but have you seen what's happening in this country? That is not an unlikely scenario. To say we're allowing SFPD, or allowing, giving them the ability to kill community members remotely and without any rules and no, no accountability is just wrong. We are talking about the extreme cases. And like I said, you haven't used it in 11 years. And the fact that we even have to bring up Las Vegas a psycho man in a hotel room with military grade weapons, thousands of rounds of ammunition, killing 61 people at a country concert. The fact that we can even talk about that normally and just like it's nothing is shocking to me. And a lot of the buzzwords around here, you know, and the fact sheet, the details, you know, the use of force is why I asked you about the use of force. Nothing changes. State law needs to be followed. Our general orders need to be followed. Accountability is there. Nothing changes on that front. And there's been buzzwords out there, I think, again, to create fear and misinformation of the militarization, militarization of the police force. And again, no context as to why police departments have had to invest in certain types of weapons is because of the militarization of our citizenry over the last 20 years. In 1994, we had an assault weapons ban, and that was because, thank you, Senator Feinstein, following several high-profile mass shootings and attacks on law enforcement and, and our citizens involving military-style assault weapons, Congress enacted the federal assault weapons ban, and unfortunately, that expired in 2004 without any consideration or action by Congress, despite the pleas of law enforcement officials across the country. I remember them pleading, please do not let this happen. Why? Go read the paper, go watch the news. You'll know why. The absolute, in this last 20 years, since the assault weapons ban went away, the militarization of our society exploded. When it expired, military-style weapons flooded the market. Not only federal laws, but laws in the majority of states were lucky to live in California, were relaxed to placate the greedy gun lobby and police departments were finding themselves outgunned. And that is not some made up thing. That actually happened. Today, our nation's police force, forces find themselves increasingly outgunned by criminals armed with sophisticated firearms and detachable capacity ammunition, ammunition magazines. Magazines holding more than 10 rounds used to be prohibited under, federal, under that federal ban, not so much anymore. When I was involved with the gun violence prevention community at this time, because I've been working on this issue for 30 years, law enforcement was right by our side saying, please don't let this happen. They said, what is happening now? The fact that we're even talking about having a robot, maybe having to disarm someone who's about ready to kill 61 people at a country concert. The fact that we're even talking about that in our country is insane. But back then, the law enforcement officials were saying to everybody, there's no reason that a peaceful society based on the rule of law needs its citizenry armed with 30 round ammunition magazines. We're literally outgunned. You're talking about the kind of firepower that can go through vehicles, through vests, and that can literally go through a house. 
after one of his officers was ambushed by a teenager wielding a semi-automatic AR-15 and fired at him 26 times, the Oklahoma police chief said there are just more and more assault rifles out there and it's becoming a bigger threat to law enforcement each day. They are outgunned. And it's true. We know that we've lost some of our very own officers to those in possession of military weapons. Officer James Gelf succumbed to gunshot wounds sustained when he was shot by a carjacking suspect. He was taken out with someone with a semi-automatic rifle as the officer approached his vehicle. Officer Gelf emptied his service weapon, which was not a military-style rifle or a gun of any kind, at the suspect and was reloading when he was shot and killed because we know a service weapon of a police officer versus a semi-automatic rifle doesn't give the police officer the greatest odds. Also, we know that Officer Espinoza, suspect opened fire with an AK-47 and then fled. He was struck multiple times and killed. So these military-style weapons are on our streets. And so when people talk about the militarization of our police force without context as to what's happening, around us is really unfair. It's as if the police force just decided it would be really fun to act like they're in the military and get all these weapons. That's not it. You're responding to what's going on in our country, the sad situation of the gun violence epidemic in our country. That's what you have to respond to. <sighs> One of the last things I want to read was from some, a police officer in July of 13, 2009, after a birthday party shootout involving a semi-automatic AK-47 <clears throat> in which two young people were killed and 10 wounded, the Miami police chief told ABC News, for me it's a no-brainer. These are weapons of war. Under no circumstance do they belong in the cities of America. Now police officers are facing, and citizens are facing, these assault weapons. We don't stop it now. What's it going to look like 10 years from now? Rambo becomes reality. Well, we are well over 10 years from now, 13 years from now. And look, that's the conversation we ought to be having. That is our dystopic sci-fi reality. That an 18-year-old can purchase a weapon of war with a credit card in Texas and walk into an elementary school and eviscerate children. With that weaponry, that is the problem. We have had over 600 mass shootings in America this year alone. It seems like our country is under constant attack. Communities ravaged by gun mass shootings barely have time to start grieving before the next tragedy takes place. We were just mourning the five people that were killed at the LGBTQ club in Colorado Springs, Colorado. A few days later, we hear about the gunman who killed six people and injured five more in a mass shooting at Walmart in Virginia. And that was only the second shooting in Virginia in only a week, following three football players that were killed on a bus at the university in Charlottesville. Earlier this month, a shooter entered Central Visual and Performing Arts High School in St. Louis, Missouri, with the intent to kill as many as possible. It's a teenager. He was armed with an assault rifle, 600 rounds of ammunition, and high-capacity magazines, the choice for mass shooters time and time again. The gunman killed a student and a teacher before his gun jammed, perhaps the one thing that saved the other countless lives. Unfortunately, we know exactly the kind of carnage that could have been possible because we see it over and over and over again. 22 killed in Uvalde, Uvalde seven killed in Highland Park. Well, at a parade for God's sakes. Well, 48 others were injured, 10 killed in Buffalo while grocery shopping, 17 killed in Parkland while being in, in high school, while 17 more were injured, 61, we mentioned this, killed in Las Vegas, 26 in Sandy Hook. I could sit here for the next hour and go over mass shooting after mass shooting after ma mass shooting because there's military-style weapons all over this country. Those are only some of the tragedies that our nation has witnessed in the past few years. Each and every single life that has been stolen should have been prevented. Yet weapons of war, military weapons, designed for mass destruction, remain on our streets. So here is the context of what is going on here for me. As to why police departments have to even think about military-style weapons, why we even have to sit here and discuss robots. It's crazy. 
There is one link between all of the deadliest mass shootings in the U.S. The gunmen used a military-style weapon, an AR-15. Uvalde, Highland Park, Buffalo, Odessa, Dayton, Aurora, Parkland, Poway, Orlando, Las Vegas, Pittsburgh, Newtown, Charleston. These are the last resort measures that can only be used in the most extreme circumstances to save lives. When all other measures are not viable, it's about officer safety, it's about the safety of all our communities, and the safety of everyone who visits the city and county of San Francisco on any given day. And so while I understand the conflict, because we have that conflict around police in San Francisco, I also understand the context, and I also understand the details. I will be voting in support of this measure today in a continued effort to keep our city, sa our city safe. And I really want to thank you, Assistant Chief Lazar, and again, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Peskin for really drilling down on a policy that holds the police department accountable, that shows what would happen in the worst case scenario, God forbid we ever get there, and thank you for, in the last 11 years, having restraint. And thank God we have never had to use this type of weaponry. But you know what? As Supervisor Dorsey said, I'm really glad we have it. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor thank you. Stephanie. Supervisor Safai.